It's match day in the world of Arsenal and we'll be going into the usual programming very shortly. I just wanted to start off today's show by mentioning the very sad passing of Sir Chips Keswick uh, who passed away and we were told about the news yesterday. Um, the former Arsenal chairman uh, was a lifelong Arsenal supporter and a regular at Highbury um, before then joining, of course, the club on the board before eventually becoming chairman. And I'd like to send my condolences to close friends and family of the former Arsenal chairman, Sir Chips Keswick. This is the Arsenal News Show. Hello and welcome to the Gouda Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of what is the Arsenal News Show. Join you every single morning. And uh, very much looking forward to speaking to you today because, of course, it is match day. Arsenal return to uh, action in the Premier League and looking to respond to what has been a very disappointing week uh, in the world of Arsenal with Aston Villa beating us the Emirates and, of course, Bayern Munich knocking us out of the Champions League on Wednesday. Arsenal need to respond. Arsenal need to get back to winning ways. And it is an absolute must-win game, as is the rest of these games over the course of the end of the Premier League season. Arsenal will most likely need to win every single remaining game in order for them to have the best chance of winning the title. Uh, and that is by means not an easy feat um, because there is going to be rotation needed and we're going to be discussing plenty of that and more in today's show. Uh, good morning to those joining us live in the chat box. Thank you so much as always for doing so. It's massively appreciated. Matt G, good morning to you, to Barry, uh, A1, Carlton, Paul, Shari, Steve, Stephen, Arasilki, Damian, Matt G, Martin, uh, Zuman UK, we've got Guna Works, uh, we've got uh, other Martin, uh, we've got Louis, Granddaddy Guna, Paul, Angela, Stevie, uh, Luke Shaw joins us, uh, Mike, Vivian, Bernadette, and uh, scrolling down a little bit more, Emeka, Rancid, Chima. Thank you so much to all you guys and girls for tuning in. Uh, I hope you had a fantastic week and that you're ready for the weekend. Um, I know that massively is dictated by, of course, Arsenal, but uh, Still, uh, it's plenty to celebrate as well as we... I've got loads going on this weekend, actually. I've got a very, very busy weekend. Two reasons. One, I've got a big engagement party in Cambridge today, but I am hopping back to London to watch the game somewhere uh, in the evening. And then tomorrow is the London Marathon. Uh, so I've got to go around London, hopping around the different sites of the London Marathon, uh, cheering on the missus. If you would like to support, of course, and you still can donate to her cause, it is the pinned tweet on the at the Guna Talk TV Twitter page, so I would direct you in that direction if you'd like to donate anything that you can. Uh, and thank you to all of those that already have. We hit Target yesterday, uh, which is amazing, uh, or last week, uh, which is brilliant. So thank you to everyone that has done. Right, let's jump into today's... Actually, before, I should also, because if I don't, we run the risk, of course. If you could drop a like on the video as well and subscribe to the channel. We did get the show on Wednesday up to, or Thursday, up to a 1,000 likes. So the challenge continues. Thank you uh, for everybody for jumping in and supporting things. But make sure you're dropping a like on the video as well. Right, let's go to today's stories. And we start in the world of transfers. Uh, according to a number of outlets uh, and those coming from Germany, but also those in England as well, and some abroad also down in South America, suggesting that Arsenal are said to be preparing an offer of 45 million euros. DAZN, I think, were actually uh, behind one of the key reports here. And the suggestions was that Arsenal were preparing a 45 million euro offer for Frankfurt defender William Pacho, or, or Pacho, uh, the uh, Ecuadorian international, uh, is very highly rated indeed, 22 years of age. He is impressed for Frankfurt. He's a left-footed centre-half, uh, which you know what that means. Maybe they'll be looking for him to maybe play a left-back role as well. Um, but uh, he's very accomplished. He's very mobile and uh, has been very impressive for Frankfurt uh, in his, still despite being of such a young age as well. But Frankfurt are said to want closer to 60 million euros to try and get any potential deal for the centre-half done. And uh, it would be a very expensive one, of course, for Arsenal to get done. Over £40 million, pounds, that is close to £50 million pounds if they were to move for the Ecuadorian international. But Arsenal is said to, do, to want a defender. And uh, with Yuri and Timber returning, maybe it's in more as a right-side option that Timber will come in for. Zinchenko's future is uncertain. Uh, and depth for the centre-back positions as well is something that Arsenal do 
want. Um, so that is why Arsenal seem to be moving for another defender. Um, moving forwards, and Bruno Guimaraes is also being spoken about as well. Um, David Ornstein on the Athletics uh, show, and I think in a article as well, spoke about Arsenal's keenness on the Brazilian international. There is said to be a release clause of £100 million in the Brazilians' deal to steal him away from Newcastle. However, the expectation that he would leave the club has been diminished somewhat by news that came out yesterday that he has purchased a new house uh, in the area um, of Newcastle. So it seems unlikely uh, that, that Bruno would be leaving Newcastle, but there is always the scope of quick changes, which is not the first time players have bought property and then had to leave. Um, but Bruno Guimaraes, a very good player, although he's got questionable um, behavioural decision-making. He is as an exceptional midfielder and one of the best in the Premier League as well now. So uh, one to look out for in the future. Uh, Mikel Arteta conducted his press conference yesterday. He was asked about the latest team news and the reaction from that game against Bayern. He says, as an experience, it wasn't the best one. A defeat in the league and a defeat in the Champions League. But I'm fully focused on times that we've had ahead with us with six games to go. We are a game behind City and we're going to give it a real go. It's worth pointing out, of course, that Arsenal will play twice before City play next, which means that Arsenal could go as well as, a, as as far as four points ahead of Man City if they were to win their next two games, really putting the pressure on their title-challenging opposition as they take part in the FA Cup this weekend. So Arsenal have a chance to go back to the top of the table this weekend with a win over Wolves and hopefully put the pressure back on their opponents. He says, the context is clear. If we win, we're top of the league. That's the context. And we don't need anything else to be motivated or to go to that game with our minds clear and our purpose very, very clear as well. He was asked about how to adapt to Saka and Erdegaard being targeted by opposition players. He says they are constantly targeted like all the best players, like any other opponent. We always try to find ways to prepare the game and try to help them if they try to do certain things to stop us, to find other ways, spaces, combinations. And this is a journey because there is always something that they try and you have to adapt it to make it work. He was asked about Yuri and Timber, who did indeed train, uh, of course, as well, and was asked for the regular weekly update on him. He says he but he plays both in both positions, um, of right and left fullback, in relation to the game and the players that we have, and asked about when he might come back. He says it is too soon. He's going to play a game with the under-21s, and after that, we will see better where he is, how he felt. He looks really good in training, but it's that last step now, and we need to have certainty that he's ready to go. They're being so extra cautious with Jury and Timber, and you can hardly blame them, of course. Arsenal's ex under-21 game is on Monday, so we might see him um, in the game away at Blackburn. There's an opportunity there. Um, whether or not it happens remains to be seen, but uh, it seems that we will not be seeing him in an Arsenal first-team shirt anywhere near. Do you remember all those like ITK claims that he'd be back in January? Goodness gracious me. It was always a case of seven to nine months. That's what we reported earliest March, latest May. That's what we were talking about on the channel. And uh, that certainly turns out to be the case. Uh, now, the channel is, of course, and we're very grateful to be sponsored by Football Prizes. Uh, there is plenty of opportunities to win some fantastic prizes of Arsenal and football-related themes on the Football Prize website, which you can go and find in today's video description. Head over there and have a peruse of the different competitions that are indeed available to you. Uh, football Prizes is a very long, supportive uh, channel partner and one that we're very grateful to to continue supporting us. So please go down to the link in the description and check out the latest prizes on offer. Of course, UK only as always, but if you've got a friend, maybe they can get you a ticket. Well, let's go to part two, shall we? And your questions right after this. Okay, part two of the show and your questions then. Uh, let's go to Kai, who says, uh, please explain why throw-ins go to players swamped by many defenders. This is actually a tactic the club have used and done it very successfully. You may notice it more so when Arsenal are in the kind of corners uh, of the opposition's defensive third. What we try and do is we try and throw the ball into players that are then able to play in behind because you can't be offside from a throw-in, and they try and use that to the best of their ability. So what we often see is a little throw-in behind to players playing close to the goal line, and it gives you sometimes a bit of an advantage. It's a risky option, but throw-ins don't technically seem to be very opportunistic plays for teams, in fact. It's actually an area of a game where I think there's a lot to be 
harnessed from to still try and maximize the potential of those um those kind of set pieces if you like but it has been very successful for arsenal actually in creating some significant um you know some significant what's the word uh opportunities for us in the games uh chin says uh do you think there was still um a chance that we will see timber play a game this season uh, i think that there's a small chance but it may be the very, very last one, two, max, maybe three games of the season. If there's more than that, I'll be shocked if he's at the Spurs game. And then you've got Bournemouth United and uh, and then Everton on the last day. So maybe the last three as a max, that potentially could be it. Uh, Temi says, thoughts on Fabio Vieira not playing because he is an Edu signing. Um no, I don't think that's anything to do with it. Arteta has been very complimentary of, of Vieira and talked about him in very kind terms. I don't think it's anything to do with him being an Edu signing. Any signing made under Arteta's tenure also counts as an Arteta signing as well. Um, you know, so he has to sign off and that he doesn't get given players. He has to work with the recruitment team to get the deals over the line in the end and they have to talk about it. Uh, Clive says, uh, Pacho is not like an Ake who is smooth. He's more of a Rudiger or Gvardio, a more of a front-footed player uh clive's been watching some youtube compilations i see uh <laughs> favorite pastime of clive's uh john says tom are there any links to uh vlahovic no not really very much quietened down there doesn't seem to be any uh indication that arsenal are moving for uh for him i'd, I'd be very surprised to see if uh if indeed arsenal were in the race for, for vlahovic can to even try and leave um if he was trying to leave Juventus, he seems very happy there. I don't think he wants to leave there. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's any opportunity that we'll be seeing him leave Juventus anytime soon. Uh, Maximilian says, hey, Tom, I'm not sure if you've covered it previously. Charles Watt speaks about Arsenal's interest in Michael Elise, uh, whose release clause activates in the summer. What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I'm not sure that Arsenal will uh, end up going for Elise. The interest is there, um, but I'd be surprised if they did, mainly because I don't think he's necessarily the profile of winger that Arsenal necessarily need or want. Um, I think that they'd be looking more so to a, a more natural winger than a technical playmaker. Uh, they need like a Nico Williams, your Pedro Neto's of this world. The, the interest exists because Elise is, is a very good player, but he's got an injury problem as well that continues to, to plague his career. Um, the release calls may, may make him somewhat um, more alluring as a potential option. But from my perspective, I think Arsenal need to go for more of a, a classic winger the more of a technical wide playmaker like Elise tends to be. Uh, Jürgen says, Tom, why don't we give El Nene a new contract? Is uh, my view of him different from others? I really like the guy because we just, we last season we gave him a new deal because it was the right thing to do. You know, a serious knee injury. He needed to recover. It didn't cost us that much. And it was the right thing to do for the squad as well. And he's, he's you know, he's coming to the side on a couple of occasions to provide depth. It was never really going to be a, a pull away from us we were never going to sign another midfielder in his place we never had the financial freedom to do that um but no we'll be he'll be moving on this summer is the expectation um kazang says someone explained to me why martinez was not sent off uh you have yellow cards are reset for penalty shoot shootout so as soon as it went to a penalty shootout the first yellow card he got during the game was written off uh, so you need to get two yellow cards in a penalty shootout to get sent off even if you've been given a yellow earlier on in the game. Uh, Dickens says, any thoughts on our season so far? <laughs> it's a pretty broad question. The thoughts are is that, again, we're progressing. I think we're a better team than we were last season. I think that we've shown that we can compete not only in a title, but alongside a Champions League campaign as well, which is never going to be easy. You can't rotate anywhere near as much, if at all, in the Champions League. If you look at when we got knocked out to Sporting, for example, in that game against Sporting, we started Nelson in the second leg. This is when we'd only drawn the away leg. We'd started Nelson instead of Saka. We started Vieira instead of Erdegaard. We started Tommy Asuit instead of White in the uh, in the last 16, was it, of the... Of the uh, of that competition, we couldn't do that against Porto, you know, and you couldn't certainly not do that against Bayern Munich. So Arsenal have progressed from last season and they have certainly discovered that they're going to need to invest heavily. It's been a season of learning and certainly one which will take into the following season as well. Um, it's ultimately disappointing that we've gone out of, of other competitions, of course, and that, you know, there's games that we should have done better in. But, you know, when you've lost just one league game in the whole of 2024, you've beaten City and Liverpool and gone to their places and, avoided defeat, not lost to a single big six side all season so far, you know, you know that we're moving in the right direction. Um, but there's still more games to play. And um, I look forward to hopefully um, seeing Arsenal succeed. But uh, it's it's 
you know, a small slither of a percentage that we might end up getting something at the end of the campaign. Um, let's go to uh, Ronald says, if Newcastle need to sell, would you go for Tonali? No, because he's going to be, I think, is he facing a potential other ban? I think he's been investigated for more betting problems. So I don't think so. Uh, Tizer says, I think Martinelli gets some unfair criticism. I believe if Erdegaard played as much on the left as he does on the right with an overlapping fullback, you might see more out of him. We need to look into the summer. I think obviously the left eight is an area that I want to see Arsenal go and sign somebody in unless you find a perfect number six. And then Rice can, of course, of course play in that left-sided position. But yeah, there's there's definite... Um, there's, there's definite uh, scope for us to improve that left eight role. Uh, Lincoln says, uh, do you think Saka could play uh, in a more attacking midfield role on the right side if, uh, say, a Rafinha option type player could be signed in Saka's current position? So the argument being there, do we move Saka internally to bring in another right winger? I think we need to bring in a winger anyway. Um, is there a scope that we could play both of the winger that we bring in for competition with Saka? Maybe. I think Saka has played actually internally during the time in which he was progressing as a player for us. I remember him playing in central midfield in attacking midfield roles under Arteta as well. So there's, there's scope for it. Um, but I don't know when that's going to happen. And, you know, the idea of bringing a winger is so you can give Saka rest and not necessarily move him into more of a, a central role, which could even, you know, arguably uh, need more energy expenditure. Uh, Samuel says, I finally made a live show. Uh, thanks for helping me gain a balanced view of Arsenal over the last couple of years. You're very welcome, Samuel. Thank you for tuning in and welcome uh, to the TGT crew. Uh, speaking of welcomes, Andrew Stewart, thank you for becoming a brand new member of the channel. Very much appreciate your time and your support and uh, welcome to the TGT family. And Vegas Gunner with a very kind donation. So who do you think is better, Reese Nelson or Marcus Edwards? I mean, Marcus Edwards has gone incredibly quiet, hasn't it? It's gone very quiet on the... Uh, the Marcus Edwards scene when he, you know, was playing in the uh, Europa League with Sporting. You know, there was a lot said about his talent. There was a lot said about teams potentially moving uh, for him again. He's now 25 years of age. I'm going to quick look at his stats from this season: four goals, four assists, and 23 uh, league matches. Is he still a regular starter? Because obviously they brought in some other players like Trincao, etc. Let's have a quick check this season. Um, he started a fair few games. I mean, the majority of the start of the season he was starting, but as the season's gone on, he's actually started to fall out of the first 11. It seems he's coming off the bench. He's being an unused substitute. So I guess his time with the team has diminished. He hasn't actually got a goal or an assist since January um, for sporting in the league. I don't know about the other competitions, but uh, maybe that says something about where his stock has, has seemingly fallen since that season as well. I remember talking on the show and a lot of people in our chat box saying we should try and sign this guy. It shows you that, you know, players can blow hot and cold and we need to remember that. Uh, Cam says, what are your thoughts on Manchester United season so far? Are they a banter club of the season? I mean, obviously you've got Chelsea, which are more so the banter side, I think, of the Premier League season. Manchester United have been incredibly fortunate with some of the games that they've ended up getting points and all the points that they've eventually amassed this campaign. They could still finish in their lowest ever Premier League position. Uh, this weekend, they're taking on Sheffield United at home. You'd expect them to win that game. West Ham United, meanwhile, are away to Crystal Palace. Um, and Chelsea, who are three points behind United with the game in hand, of course, play us on Tuesday because they're not playing a game this weekend because of the FA Cup. They're going to have a very busy end, Chelsea, to the end of the season, despite not playing in any European competition. So, And then Brighton, of course, six points behind as well. They're taking on Manchester City. And we've got to hope, and that's in midweek, of course. So we've got to hope that... Uh, Brighton can do us a favour, fully well-rested after Man City playing the Champions League and, of course, play uh, this week in the FA Cup. Brighton will not have played a game since last weekend. Hopefully that falls in Arsenal's favour and they'll be fully ready and rested for that City game. We can only keep fingers crossed that that is the case. Uh, Z says, Tom, who do you expect to be rotated today? How many Arsenal players do you have in your FPL currently? I have three uh, at the moment. I've had Rice. I brought Rice in before that game against West Ham where he got loads of points um, and I've had him ever since. I've also got Havertz and Saka because um, they were getting a fair number of points. But they're the three Arsenal players I have, which is a lot of midfield. This week is bench boost week. Um, looking to get some extra points in my bench boosts. It's the last kind of, uh, what's it called? The the boosters that you've got to, to use throughout. But uh, I'm looking for some big points. I've actually dropped Haaland, believe it or not, this week. But uh, he's out the team completely, out the squad completely because they don't play a game until Thursday. But uh, And he's he's been suffering a little bit, hasn't he, fitness-wise, I guess. So... 
He's out of the squads. Three strikers, Solanke, Darwin Nunez and uh, Isak are the three that are in there at the moment. I should have Watkins, really, but uh, he hasn't got a double game week, so I didn't. I went with Solanke instead. Albrecht says, is there any credibility in the links with Sudakov from Shakhtar Donetsk? He could fit well into the left eight role. Absolutely no idea, mate. I've not heard anything on that front. Uh, Cupid says, uh, do you think Werner would be picked over Havertz in the Euros? I don't think so. Havertz has made his way back into the centre forward position under Julian Nagelsmann, and I'd expect him to stay there. And speaking of Nagelsmann, he signed a brand new contract with the German national side, keeping him there until at least after the 2026 World Cup, which means, of course, that Liverpool or Bayern Munich um, will not be getting their hands on on Nagelsmann in the near future. Um, Daniel says, if Arteta were to leave, who would you want to have as manager? Absolutely no idea, Daniel, because uh, A, I don't expect him to leave, and I don't really necessarily foresee a a viable option to, to come in at the moment. Uh, Cam says, personally, Rashford needs to play for a club going up, not down, to get him his best. They'll sack their manager in the summer as well. Rashford's an interesting profile, fantastic player. Um, just hasn't really found his feet this season under 10 Arg, and either as many of the Man United players either. Um, there's a lot to be said about Manchester United, but uh, it's probably best kept elsewhere than here. Uh, Albrecht says, OK, means just agents spreading reach for their clients again. Damn, he's quality. It doesn't necessarily mean just because I haven't heard anything, Albert, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, my reaches are only certainly restricted to what I, the contacts I have, doesn't mean that it doesn't it exist or isn't true necessarily. But I'm just saying I've, I've personally heard nothing on, on that front. There's certainly times where agents uh, and the player side of things does drive deals. Amadou Anana is a great example. That was uh, that was certainly a deal that's that in retrospect seems a lot more on the player side, because on the Arsenal side, there was certainly plenty of um, uh, pushback against the idea that Anana was a player that we were looking at in January. It seemed more so from the player side that that was the case. Um, and I'm somebody who reported on it because of the, the contacts that way. But it's uh, it's important, of course, that you take it in from all sides. So the Arsenal side, not keen. It seems as much player side seen there was more keenness. So it's an interesting world to find the balances is transfers. It's why I prefer not necessarily reporting on them too much. But uh, because they can be very volatile. Uh, Tyson says, hey, Tom, uh, due to the Euros, uh, it would be ideal to get players in beforehand as prices could therefore skyrocket. Uh, do you think this could mean players with reasonable release clauses are more sought after as well? Absolutely, of course, especially in summers with those tournaments. It can give players like Nico Williams, exactly, if he has a great tournament with Spain. But sometimes players like to wait until after the Euros to secure their future. Others like to have it sorted before the tournament, like Mbappe said to want to have his future already wrapped up and decided before the Euros this summer. Other players like to wait until afterwards because they think maybe they could get a better deal if they perform better in the Euros. They might have more clubs interested if they play well during the Euros. It's a, it's a big chess game is the transfer window. So I'd hope Arsenal would get their deals done quickly, but you can't always expect too much when there's a summer tournament on. I ideally want to see Arsenal get their business done before the, the pre-season tour or at least after before it's concluded. And we've got games back like the Emirates Cup, for instance. And who knows? Maybe a community shield, of course, as well. If Arsenal finish second uh, and Man City win the league and the FA Cup, they play the community shield. If they win the league, they'll play the community shield. So there's, th there's still two pathways Arsenal have into that um, start of season tournament, of course. Uh, Matt says, who would be your personal choice, Hato or Pacho? I lean towards Pacho because I think he's more established right now. Hato is definitely a fantastic talent and, and very exciting indeed. But... You know, I feel like Arsenal would need to lean more on ready-made players. And while still young at 22, Pacho is definitely ahead of Hato in terms of, of development. So in the summer, if you were to pick one of the two, and they'd be, I think, similarly priced, around 40 to 50 million pounds, I think that Pacho is, is probably the better one to lean to because of the seniority and the the, the readiness compared to, to Hato. That's not to say that Hato couldn't prove me wrong. I just think that Pacho is showing more readiness right now. Uh, Belligol says, um, uh, what do you think is the best way to keep Saka fit throughout the season? Seeing how he played during February showed me how much he's been struggling for fitness. It's obviously one part of it is about signing a player that you can rotate more successfully in games that you don't necessarily need to start him. I mean, yeah, even Phil Foden started a lot of games this season, but he's also been rested in some, whereas Saka hasn't been able to be rested. The only time we've really rested Saka is when we've been forced to. So you think about the Luton home game, he just wasn't fit for that. He probably would have started if he was deemed fit enough. You think about the Man City game, he didn't start because he wasn't fit. Whereas Phil Foden, of course, was rested, you know, against, uh, was it the Luton game as well, actually, for Man City? I think it was. Rodri and Foden rested for that game, you know. So they afford to rest those players. But even though they play the majority of games, they can still afford to do that. So it's also about bringing them off at half time if we're leading by a significant amount. 
I point to the Sheffield United game. I point to the Lons game. I point to the, the West Ham game. Those players should have been off at halftime. Um, when you're 4-0, 5-0 up in those games at halftime, you can bring your best players off at halftime. It is not a problem, especially when you've got five substitutes that you can make at three different points. And halftime doesn't even count as one of those three different points in a game. You can make a, a substitution at halftime that doesn't count towards your three sub allocation timings. So it made absolutely no sense to keep those players on at halftime. And yet we did. And Martinelli got injured against Sheffield United and we paid the price for that. So I hope that was something of a learning curve for Arteta. Um, Rob says, is Vieira likely to be picked for the Euros? I, very much unlikely, uh, Rob. No, I don't think it is. Uh, I pray for Eddie to go on a scoring run to get picked for the Euros. Again, very unlikely, not with Tony now back on the scene. Watkins scoring exceptionally. Kane, of course, there as well. I don't think there's any chance of Eddie Nketiah getting into the squad. Solanke, of course, I think would probably be ahead of, of Nketiah as well. Uh, Albrecht says, Ajax might also prefer to keep their big talents this window to consider their, to continue their rebuild after last summer's big sale. Absolutely. That's why they signed him up to a brand new contract, is Hato. Uh, Damien says, I wonder who will be at the, the Euros version of Amrabat, the average player that has a good few games and everyone decides is world class. Indeed. It's always careful. You need to be very conscious of players that have good tournaments playing on an international scene in in, in their in their nation uh, as opposed to their um their club and Amrabat was certainly one of those he I think he pulled the wool over a lot of people's eyes you know in the summer window I had so many fans in my um listener chat saying you know Amrabat's the guy you know don't get Declan Rice don't spend 100 million on, De on Declan Rice go and get Amrabat for cheaper and it's like wow that, that view now looks absolutely mad uh, Rance says, we're losing games since you told people not to put tomatoes in their fridge. Is it a coincidence? <laughs> Absolutely, it's a coincidence, mate, because you're mad if you put tomatoes in the fridge. Uh, we all know that. It's a very well-established view at this moment in time. Uh, Maximia says, Tom, there's an overall mood of doom and gloom within the Arsenal fan base. I just want to let everyone know it's not over until it's over. Predicted scoreline, Arsenal 2, Wolves 1. I'll go over 3-1 Arsenal win in today's game. Looking forward to watching it in London a little bit later on this evening. Um, yeah, the doom and gloom is always going to exist. I think it's a yeah. Obviously, there's disappointment that the season is is going in a direction which we didn't want it to, and it's petering out somewhat. Um, we've still got the league, and unless there's a bad result today, we will still have the league. If we don't win today, it's definitely over. Like, there's not you can't beat around the bush. You know, if we don't win today, it's it's done. Um. It's, it may not mathematically be done, but I'm sorry. But when you've got Liverpool in the race as well, I don't see lose dropping points necessarily either. Um, you, you, we've got to win the rest of our games. Um, there's no way we win the league without doing that. So, and we can do, we can do that. You know, you think about the games that we've had in the league this season. Uh, sorry, in in 2024, if you look at our record in 2024, it's very, very good. Um, you go back to the start of the of the year. And you look at the first game that we had in the Premier League of 2024, 5-0 against Palace, 2-1 win against Nottingham Forest, 3-1 win against Liverpool, 6-0 win away at West Ham, 5-0 win against Burnley, 4-1 win against Newcastle, 6-0 win against Sheffield United, 2-1 win against Brentford, and then the draw at Manchester City. Before that, eight wins in a row with some very difficult sides like Newcastle, like Liverpool, like away to West Ham, which we'd already lost to this season. It's definitely not within the realms of, you know, Un unthinkable uh, that Arsenal couldn't uh, that, that Arsenal could go and, and win the next six games, but it's uh, it's definitely still a huge challenge. Uh, this can't be right, which is probably a correctly named account considering this comment. Says how on earth are United where they are with their shocking goal difference? They're jammy ASF, <laughs> you know. Uh, absolutely, they are jammy. Um, they're very lucky. Um, behind Spurs, they're probably the luckiest team in the Premier League this season. So. Yes, United are. In some ways, I'm kind of glad because it means Eric Ten Hag might stay and you want him to stay because he's limited and he restricts them as a coach. So the better they do from this point forwards is, other than when we go to Old Trafford, of course, is probably a good thing for Arsenal um, to keep Ten Hag in the job. Uh, Frida says, I never put my tomatoes in the fridge. Another way to show this show has made my life better. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Bella Girl says, I don't think about losing. If we beat Wolves and Chelsea, we go four points clear with City's games in hand being Forest away and Brighton away. Indeed, it's important to point that out. Uh, Tizer says, can you think of a, a player similar to Odegaard who could, we could go for in the summer? Doesn't have to be a main name, but one that you think is doing well. I'm so concerned for our player if he gets injured. And he never, of course, gets a rest. It, I mean, Odegaard is such a such an endemic player. It feels like at times he stands out as, as just kind of a unique 
profile. He's so technically gifted, so creative. His vision and execution of his passes can be unbelievably good. His stats for kind of progression are absolutely crazy. So trying to find a player that you can go and get that can offer you the creativity of, of Erdegaard and the technical ability of him and the leadership and the energy that he brings you as well is, is very, very difficult. I'm trying to think in Premier League terms, like looking down the table, which players are are there. I mean, maybe you could look at someone like Paqueta at, at, um, at West Ham um, as, as an option. I like this one from Jabu, Danny Olmo. He's more... I don't know if he's necessarily like as much Erdegaard, but he is an attacking midfielder that's, that's very, very gifted. Um, and and a, he's obviously on the older side of things as well. I think he's mid to late 20s now these days. But uh, Danny Olmo is definitely a, a very, very talented player. Oh, he's only 25, actually. I'll take that back. He's uh, 25. So this season for Leipzig, uh, f only the four goals and five assists. Uh, but yeah, I think he's had some injury issues this campaign. Yeah, he was out at the start of the season with a... What is that? An acromyoclavicular joint dislocation. Goodness gracious me. I don't think I've ever even heard of that word before. What is an acromy acromyoclavicular? It is the joint in the shoulder where the two bones meet. Wow. Goodness gracious. So, so a dislocated shoulder basically is the, the, the really easy way of saying it. Goodness. I just, I just saw such a long word pop on my screen and I wondered what on earth had happened to the man. Uh, but yeah, dislocated shoulder. Really difficult injury, that, because it can obviously, um, you can really easily redo your shoulder. And he had a knee injury at the start of the season as well. He's been in the wars a little bit. I don't necessarily look at that as like a, is he an injury prone player? Let's have a look at his injury history, Danny Olmo. Um, when he does miss games, he misses quite a stretch. 22-23 in in a knee ligament tear in 22-23 had a tall muscle fiber. He missed 20 games for Spain and, and Leipzig because of that. This season, he missed 11 matches with a knee injury. He missed 16 games with that dislocated shoulder. Um, but I don't think that's I don't think that's indications of uh of being injury prone. They just seem like unfortunate injuries rather than kind of like you when you think about muscular problems which continually keep you out. But yeah, in 2020, what 21-22, he had a tall muscle fiber on two occasions, which Kept him out for the start of the season as well for 17 games. So I guess I don't, I, it's difficult to judge sometimes. You think, are these players um, injury prone? You look at those injuries specifically, and he's, he's not really outside of those from the last two to three years. He's not had anything. So, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter these days. Anyone who joins Arsenal, we know he's going to get injured. So does it really matter? Um, Ashman says, do you think there'll be any changes happening in the lineup? I hope so. I think we need to. I think we need to make some changes because. The players are shattered, and we've got two huge games coming up this week. And yeah, I would make some, I would make some changes uh, based upon that. Uh, Neil says, "Morning, Tom. Do you remember the last time we scored from a direct free kick? It feels like it's been ages. Burnley away, twenty twenty one, I think twenty one. Burnley away, yellow shirt, Erdegaard's um, was the last time we scored from a direct free kick. Um, so." I would go with that, Neil, I think is the last time. But you're right. It's uh, it's certainly something that maybe we need to be better at. We need to have more of a, a free kick, especially. We don't tend to win, do we? Too many free kicks in kind of those positions. We're so quick with our movement and passing that we don't tend to get fouled, I guess. Um, but yeah, there you go. Knowledge. Uh, Alan says, I saw people from Spain saying that Zubamendi got the potential to be like Busquets. Um, sorry for my bad English. Don't apologize, Alan. That was absolutely perfect, mate. Um I think he's been compared to Busquets before. I think there's more similarities to someone like Jorginho as well uh, as as a player. He's more of kind of a an orchestrator than a you know than a tough tackling kind of defensive midfielder. He's more of a passer, which Arteta does like. So if he turns out to be the guy, that's certainly going to be the traits in which I think we would have lent towards uh, as to why we went for. For Zuba Mendy. Uh, right. Uh, I think we'll end the show there. I did forget to, to push you again to, to make sure you drop a like on the video. So please make sure you do. If you're listening on Catch Up, please hop over to YouTube to support the cause. Uh, I can see as well that there are nearly 200 of you listening on Twitter as well. Make sure you hop over to YouTube. It's the way you can watch and drop in your comments and questions into our chat box if you're watching on Twitter. So make sure you hop over to YouTube and show us plenty of support as well. Uh, do drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Turning those notifications on so you never miss a show. We do these every single morning at the same time every single day. Have a fantastic day. I know it'll be massively influenced by Arsenal's result later on. 
I'm going with a 3-1 Arsenal win. Let us know your predictions down below in the comment section. Of course, if you're listening on audio platforms, thank you for catching up. Come over to YouTube and drop a like and leave a review, of course, if you're listening on iTunes or a five-star rating if you're on Spotify. Uh, I will see you again very soon. Have a fantastic Saturday. Stay safe, stay well, stay happy and respectful. And as always, up the Arsenal. 